So this is an introduction of magnetostatic. So it follows chapter 10 in my textbook. And essentially what we want to do is look at steady current problems that create a static field or uh, we can approximate as a quasi-static magnetic fields. When this is uh, the current problem, then your electric field and your magnetic flux density are decoupled. So remember the generic equations, uh, these two, where you have curl of electric field equals the negative time rate of change of your magnetic flux density. This, this other field, we'll get into the origins of it in a minute earlier. Much earlier in the uh, class, we talked about one form of uh, Maxwell's equations. Not exactly in this form, but I'll, sh I'll show you where this comes from and how it connects with what's known as your, your magnetic field H. So um, this will be defined below in terms of magnetic flux density as well as we'll introduce magnetization M. And we also have uh, current density. So if you have free flowing charges in a conductor, you'll have this current density in addition to a time rate of change of electric displacement. So my D is that electric displacement that's associated with bound charge motion. All right, so when we're strictly speaking about quasi-static or exactly static problems, both of these are zero, and we're left with these two equations. Um, <clears throat> coming back to the more general or microscopic form, we have divergence of the magnetic flux density. So this always holds, whether or not it's static, quasi-static, or time-dependent. So this is slightly different than Gauss's law, where you have div D equals, in general, you could have a free charge density. This is always divergentless. Um, so that simplifies one of our continuity conditions. Um, the other equation is curl of that, uh, curl of your B field equals permeability of free space, your current density, and the curl of a magnetization. So if you go back and compare this to this form, the reason we use that form is it simplifies the problem down, um, but it introduces the magnetic field in terms of two other more fundamental fields. Uh, that should be an underline. That's a vector, magnetization vector, just like your B field. And here's your uh, your constant permeability of free space, 4 pi, 10 to the negative 7. All right. So let's m make a few approximations or simplifications. Let's say often that you can often say that magnetization is linear proportional to your magnetic field. It's proportional to this magnetic susceptibility constant. And if we <clears throat> start with the general relation here, do the substitution, and we get this down to this form. And this is my relative permeability. It has to be greater than or equal to 1. All right. So we can check this, you can plug this back in, crank it through this microscopic form of Maxwell's equations, and in the end things cancel and you get this equation. You can make a further simplification if there's no current flowing, no current density, now your field is irrotational. Um, the only thing you have to make sure of is remember you've got magnetization inside here, so um, that can influence this irritational problem. So the two key equations, magnetostatics is one of these forms, the curl of the magnetic field, and divergence of the B field. And so I'm not going to get into the interface or boundary conditions, but you should know from electrostatics that the normal component of this B field, it has to be continuous across an interface. So remember using divergence theorem we can show that. So that's always going to hold. 
and analogous to the electric field, the magnetic field has a similar property on an interface. So your tangential magnetic field is going to be continuous across an interface if there's no current free uh, current density. If that's present, then you take the limit down and you'll have a jump in that tangential field that depends on your surface current. <clears throat> thing I want to end this with, this initial discussion, is origins of your magnetization in materials. So if you start out at an atomic scale, there's three contributions. One is you may have intrinsic spin on your nucleus, intrinsic spin on the electrons, and then these things are moving in space over an orbit, so you may have orbital motion. All these may contribute to that magnetization. So in this class we're focused on homogenization, so that atomic behavior. So the way you can think of it is you've got this current loop moving around some centroid. If you take the curl of that or the, the, the cross product you get this vector here and that is your magnetic moment. So um, we're taking right hand rule on that current of charge moving around a loop over its area. That's my magnetic moment, right? So if you take that concept and now we look at a bulk crystal with some volume delta V, you may have these in all different directions depending on the type of material. So you have a bunch of magnetic moments. My magnetization is the summation of all those divided by that volume. So in a sense this has analogies to polarization. So we take a lot, all our dipole moments, we sum them up, divide by the volume, and get an effective polarization. Same thing for magnetization.